Welcome to this 23rd KCAR Zoom talk. Today it's Gordon Kubenick, one of our favorite Ottawa KCAR members who walks the talk. He has electric vehicle, he has solar hung on his roof, and, um, and, and he sings in the shower, he tells me. Um, he has a daughter with perfect pitch, and, and um, she pleaded with him to stop singing in the shower. So he does that, but he's now going to sing for us about a semi-serious look at net zero carbon living. Over to you, Gordon. All right, well, welcome. Um, I'm hoping to uh, educate you a little bit, but mostly entertain you on this dreary Wednesday. Um, you can see there a sign, so I'll start off with that. Uh, when we moved to the country here south of Ottawa, our lawn was covered with big fat robins, and my wife decided that since we had moved from the city to the country that we needed a something to distinctive so people could find us through the pine forest because our house is not visible from the road and she said well instead maybe calling it fat robin wouldn't be that uh, appropriate so we are now a plump robin instead of a fat robin uh, so that is uh, at our driveway that sign if you ever need to find us uh, outline goes like this i'm going to start with motivation uh, I bother. Uh, I'll look at successes and more importantly at failures. And of course, uh, in spite of what Art says, everybody wants to know about money. Uh, and then some lessons so that uh, if you know anybody who wants to do uh, anything approaching net zero, that they can not uh, suffer the, some of the pain and suffering that I have. Um, these ladies here are in the picture because uh, among this is a message that uh, it's not really just about the technology, it's, it's about behavior and how you share and allocate resources with other people. That is um, a magic part of the formula. My mother is on the right, my mother-in-law is on the left, they both live in our house. A uh, very simple reason, we thought it could not be sustainable to live in a big house like we had once the children left. So when we had the three kids here, this house was perfect. About the two of us, it was just absurd. We invited the mothers in once their, uh, unfortunately their husbands passed away and uh, they now are part of Plump Robin Hollow. Uh, motivation I think is key. Uh, my experience is being, unless I have a gun to my head, a deadline or a lot of a good reason I have aspirations but you know I really don't do anything uh, so my particular motivation was uh, I got sick about 17 years ago and I had a couple of years to think about life and at that time I uh, did three couple of things I became a third order Franciscan uh, which is basically following uh, the sort of worldview and values of St. Francis uh, uh, the, the saint, uh, an environmentalist among other things. And then of course, uh, you always think about your kids. And I was talking a lot about the environment and I've been involved with the Green Party, et cetera, for years, but really hadn't done anything. And uh, I discovered that uh, talk is cheap and unless you actually do something, you have no credibility. Uh, the real challenge, the gauntlet that really kickstarted this was my sister-in-law. Uh, she, we were having a chat at the family cottage and he said, Gord, blah, blah, blah. We were talking about climate change, blah, 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 you know, and uh, she said, that's all very well, but you know, you don't do anything. You have a, you just live like the rest of us. You fly, you do this, you do that. You have a car. I mean, like you're basically full of crap, you know, uh, and I had to admit that she was right. And so she was the final straw to get me moving. So if you have a person like that, uh, be grateful for them. They can help you move along constructively. Um, so let's start off with some good news. Uh, started off with the uh, microfit program. So the roof is covered in solar panels front and back. And uh, I was able to get in in the uh, first couple of years when they were paying a uh, exorbitant 80 cents a kilowatt hour. Uh, 
And I was also lucky enough to uh, have a friend who was an accountant tell me that I should create a numbered company so that when I purchased all my material, I did not pay the HST, which saved me a good $14,000. Uh, so I'm grateful for that person. And that's been operating for the last uh, dozen years or so. And it's been great. Uh, it, uh, one of the things I want to say in success, there's sort of two bits. There's having the, or three bits. There's the having the idea, say, oh, I want to do solar. And then there's the, the money. Can you afford it? And what's the cash flow and what's the return on investment? And then the, that times in with timing. Uh, I've discovered that if I'm too early or too late with technology or subsidies, because uh, there's both factors, you know, it, things don't work out as well. Uh, in this case, with the solar, I was able to get it at the premium price with the numbered companies. Uh, the price was high, but the math worked out favorably, so the timing was right. Uh, a few years later, uh, we put in a geothermal system, a uh, ground source heat pump. Uh, did that once again. There was a small federal subsidy at the time, and that has worked out very well. Uh, what we didn't realize at the time that it, the real advantage of geothermal is actually cooling. Uh, the, the, the cooling is extremely comfortable and extremely cheap. Um, I didn't realize how qualitatively um, superior it was to AC. Uh, so both in terms of quality of life and, and of course cost. Uh, that brings another success. When I think about success, it isn't just carbon footprint and money. It's also this idea that it should make your life better. You're, I mean, it's nice to be altruistic, but I'm a big believer that altruism should also be practical. And it turns out that geothermal is just a nice, a much nicer quality of air in the house. Um, hopefully, Art will confirm that later on. A couple of years ago, there was a, I heard from a friend, there was this wonderful subsidy for triple pane windows. So we, we jumped on the bandwagon and uh, it's a, it made a surprising difference. Um, in our bedroom, we have one triple pane window and the other one isn't. And I can see the condensation on the double, old double pane and no, no condensation on the triple pane. So it's certainly, uh, I've noticed a difference with that. Um, as I said, part of this is not just technical, it's a sort of values and, and saying, you know, it's not just about me. Um, my mother-in-law several years ago, her husband died and she was alone a lot and uh, flying back and forth uh, a lot as well. So we said, well, why don't you just come live with us, you know, and uh, you'll be happier. And uh, she did that and it's worked out very well. Uh, about just under a year ago, my mother had a stroke, and so she was not able to drive anymore or live alone, so she moved in. And so they, uh, this entire half of the house belongs to my mother-in-law on the left, and we have a full basement apartment with washer, dryer, kitchen, the whole works underneath, a very large space, and that belongs to my mother. And that kind of is great, because now we live in the part of the house, which is a sensibly sized house, so we get, we get about one third of our house for ourselves, which is just about right. Um, the other success is that this is really a big deal. I've had a lot of friends do wonderful things and then shortly after they do wonderful things, they're divorced or something, some equivalent uh, emotional trauma, which sort of undoes all their good work. And so I've, we've worked very hard together to make this happen, my wife and I. So the expression happy wife, happy life, it's a big deal that my wife has been very happy with these choices and has been engaged in part of the process. And that is uh, not to be underrated. Uh, none of this works unless your partner is on board and feels like, wow, you know, this has actually made my life better. You know, I haven't just saved the world, uh, you've, you know, you've saved our marriage too, which is uh, a, an important success. Uh, another couple of successes is our electric cars. We started off with a little electric smart. So before the Paris Accord, I managed to get a used electric car uh, for, in Toronto, 
And uh, since I'm here to entertain you, uh, those of you, uh, you, most of you should know, know that the, the smart electric car only goes 100 kilometers. Toronto is farther than 100 kilometers away. So it's like, how does Gord get it here? And so this is what I did is it was November and I uh, jumped in the, the car and drove, you know, about 80 kilometers and stopped by the side of the road and phoned CAA. And uh, I have a CAA gold card. Now, what that allows me to have is three 200 kilometer tows per year uh, uh, free of charge. So I phoned them and the guy kind of came along and towed me 200 kilometers, which was just about Kingston Way. And then I charged a little bit and drove a little bit. And then I phoned them again. And they then towed me, the next guy towed me to Kentville and then I got home. And uh, that was how I got the smart electric car. And so that is to realize that, you know, if you're creative and bullheaded enough, you can get things that, you know, seem impossible to happen. You just have to want it badly enough and you can make it happen. But you have to, you have to be pretty desperate, I got to admit. Uh, it worked out very well. I, I did this to illustrate the idea of the prototype. When you, I'm an engineer, and one of the big lessons uh, as in engineering is that generally the first time you employ new technology or a new idea, it doesn't work or it doesn't work like what you thought. You have to do some tweaks to it. So I purpose got the car because, you know, an electric car uh, is a big investment. And I, so I made a small investment to see how it worked for our lifestyle. How did it work for the family? It worked extremely well. And then once we had that under the table and everybody was happy, we realized that the performance was far superior, the cost of operation with like tiny, uh, uh, like a fraction of a gasoline car. We then sprung and got a brand new Bolt in 2017. Uh, of course, uh, you, some of you might say, why didn't I get a Tesla? Uh, it was quite simple, it had to do with the subsidy. Uh, I uh, have been in politics. I've been a Green, Green Party candidate five times. Uh, at the time, Liberals had put in a subsidy, and without the subsidy, uh, I would find it hard to justify the cost to my wife. We are not flush. Uh, even though we live near Manatic, we are not the Manatic crowd with the mansions and the uh, BMWs crowd. That's not uh, who we are. And so the subsidy made this affordable and made it marketable in terms of convincing my wife. And I knew that waiting for the Tesla by that, the conservatives, I guessed, were going to win the election. And so I said, we have to get the car before the election. And the Tesla, because of their production of problems with the Model 3, they weren't going to make the due, they weren't going to make our election date. I don't think California was thinking about the Ontario election. And so I bought this car uh, in Montreal, just to once again, make a point of stubbornness. At the time, these cars were in high, high demand and there were very few of them available, especially in Ontario. They were mostly being sold in Quebec because Quebec actually has a quota of how many, what percent electric cars the companies have to sell to have the privilege of selling cars in Quebec. So I looked every day online for cars in Quebec to buy, and this one came up, and I was able to drive. Uh, it was a cancelled order, and I was able to get there and get the subsidy before uh, the election. And of course, on the day of the election, the Conservatives cancelled the subsidy. It's been a fantastic car, uh, uh, super cheap to operate. We'll get into that later, but just to, it, it, it does have its awkwardness. You do have to think about charging. 98% uh, of our charging is at home, as you can see here. Uh, but we were, we have been able to go to Cape Breton with it. And the cost to get to Cape Breton one way was $70. So it uh, obviously took longer, uh, but it works. Um, at the same time, we uh, got bees. If you want to be sustainable, you have to do lots of gardens. We have gardens and I've done, been doing beekeeping, which has been good fun. And of course, uh, before all this, even I stopped flying. So that was part of the lifestyle as well. And we have, we go biking and we go canoeing instead of flying. Um, little, all the things for uh, in terms of lifestyle, we have a clothesline 
And as you can see, our back lawn, uh, there's no fertilizer. We don't water the grass, as you can see. This was in the middle of the drought this summer. The weeds were doing very well, thank you very much. Uh, but I think part of sustainability is are these kinds of behaviors, which really anybody can do. Um, the details matter. Uh, you know, the devil is in the details. Uh, and so just having a good idea, uh, in, I don't think means very much. So the, to make this happen in the real world, uh, timing in terms of subsidies and is the, the technology mature, is the make or break it, you have to spend a lot of time doing research. I mean, I spent, my wife said, it's like I spend half my life researching stuff so I, we don't do something stupid. So for example, I learned about, when I did the solar panels about creating this uh, numbered company and that saved me $9,000. And unless I would have done research, I would never would have known that. Um, you have to wait for the technologies to mature. I'll go into a little failure later on about that. Um, I did do the math. Um, I know that uh, some people think the numbers don't matter, but you know, these, a lot of these investments are extremely expensive. And unless you can uh, amortize it and do it incrementally, you know, it, it didn't work. I had to make it work within our cash flow and within our credit line. So I always did the math to make sure I could do the next thing and not feel you know, solar panel rich, but cash poor, so we couldn't do anything else. Um, and the last point is, it needs to improve your quality of life. Uh, this isn't just, uh, you know, life is short, life is sweet, life is wonderful. Yes, I want to save the world, but I want to save my world as well. Because if, if I'm grumpy, that doesn't help anybody. Um, so as an example of that, the electric car that we have, it turns out is our most comfortable car. It has the most performance, it's the most reliable, it's the most fun to drive, and uh, it turns out also to be the cheapest car that we've ever had to drive. So, you know, if you're smart about it, you, you can have your cake and eat it, uh, but you do have to, you know, spend the time and effort to make sure that that happens. Um, I have uh, friends, uh, as well. So part of the success is sharing. So I've said it's not just technology. Uh, this is also uh, sort of lifestyle and you know, values as the values committee talks about. These are three gardens we have. I, we have a big property. We have four acres south of Manatic. Uh, this uh, garden in the far back is run by a friend of ours uh, who we've known for many years who lives in Greeley. And so he said, uh, he grew up as a farmer and he said, you know, my soil is no good. So let me try something there. So he ran this garden in the back. Uh, another friend uh, just moved to his cottage, but still he and his wife wanted to get their thumbs dirty. So they set up this garden in the front lawn. And my wife and my mother operate this garden by our back door. So we have three gardens and we share the space. And during COVID, people have come and go, gone and you know, done their gardening and we say hi and have a cup of tea. And uh, this is part of sustainability. It's not just the gardening, uh, but it's that, you're, that we share it with other people. Um, a big thing, which is uh, we sort of fell into um, a little point here. A lot of this was, I would call semi-planned just like this is semi-serious, this was all semi-planned. We had a, a general idea that we wanted to live lightly upon the earth and the details of how to do it were definitely not clear. And uh, what has happened is uh, these two ladies, my mother and mother-in-law uh, now live with us. Uh, they occupy a significant fraction of the house. Uh, they go up and down this driveway every day in the sort of three seasons. That's their exercise. My mother walks her dog. Uh, my mother-in-law in the back here, she goes every day to the end of the driveway and gets her mail. Um, and they each have a stair lift. So we've put it in stair lifts for each of them. They only all have their private stairs and private spaces. And that's worked out very well. Uh, it's been good for them, good for us. Uh, there is uh, a bit of enlightened self-interest in that, um, 
we hope that when we're older, our kids will also, uh, you know, consider us in whatever they do and not, uh, it may be like this, it may be some other solution, but, you know, it's all about walking the talk. And, uh, and I mean, if you care for the earth, I think we actually, uh, are, it behooves us to also take care of each other to, to our limits. Uh, I'm, once again, I want to emphasize that I'm not recommending any of these particular actions for anybody else. These, this is not the path or the silver bullet. This just happens to be what we did as we lurched along trying to figure out what works for our situation. Um, and the, we call them the grannies, and they're, they're, they've been very happy here. Uh, what's been advantageous is because uh, there's two of them, they get to chat each other every day, and they, they generally go into our sunroom uh, every afternoon and have a glass of wine and talk about the good old days and their challenges of the day. And uh, it's, it's very good that they have each other to, to be with uh, and, and chat each other with. And once again, this really wasn't planned, but it certainly fit in with our ethos. So when uh, the opportunity came along, we, uh, we tried it out. And uh, I have no idea how long it will last. You know, we, we very much go day by day. Uh, we do have the challenge of what I would call our sanity. And uh, we have some uh, girl friends of our daughters. Our daughters are university age. And friends of our daughters or, or our daughters come and granny sit when we would need to get away. So every few weeks, we have the need to wait, go to the family or something like that. Uh, some university age girls help granny sit for us, which is essential. Um, another kind of sharing, in this case, talking about sharing with the wildlife. Uh, swimming pools are wonderful, and uh, but not terribly sustainable, especially if it's concrete and chlorine. So this is our pool. Uh, I've been swimming in this all summer. Every time I jump in, uh, the, uh, several frogs scoot out of the way. Uh, but once again, we kind of lurched into this. Um, we had a golden retriever when our children were young, and there was a pond across the road. And the dog, of course, wanted to go there because the Goldens are water dogs. And I figured uh, we're going to have a dead dog pretty soon because we live on a country road. So I got a neighbor to come over with a backhoe and dig this for our dog so the dog would swim here instead of getting killed across the road. And it was successful. Our dog did not get killed. And our kids would then go swimming with the dog. Um, at the beginning, I must admit, it was simply a mud hole, uh, not terribly advertised, ad sort of appealing. But it took about 10 years, and the wildlife, the bulrushes and the the flood, everything just filled in and now it's beautiful and crystal clear. We do nothing except we did have to top it off with a hose this summer because of the drought. So sort of once a week for a day, I've got the, the hose and filled it, filled it up to keep it level, but that was it for maintenance. And it's once again, part of the, the sharing kind of thing and making it sustainable in terms of energy inputs. Uh, we get a lot out and we don't have to put a lot in. Uh, and the price was right. Uh, the, the cost to dig this was far less than one visit to the vet. Um, there have been a bunch of failures, uh, and uh, they have been told us, uh, I've learned a little bit every time and learned not to freak out when they happen. Uh, when we put the germal, geothermal in, uh, the company, uh, basically they were a bit of, a, I'm not sure, I'm not sure I would call them the most reputable company. They really wanted to clinch the deal. And so they sold a system that was too small. And so when it's really cold, it really is not adequate for heating the entire house. Uh, perfectly fine for cooling, uh, but uh, at minus 20, it, it really doesn't cut it. Uh, so we had to add a uh, pellet stove in the basement to, to, for those really cold days. Uh, luckily for us, those minus 20 days have become fewer and fewer over time. So I'd say now it's almost the right size because it, it works to minus 10, no problem, uh, but not more than that. So that was definitely unfortunate. Um, I mentioned that we, uh, 
got a bat battery pack. Um, so back, this is pre-Tesla. I had this wonderful idea that we would live off grid. Uh, that did not work. Uh, and the battery pack I got at the time, lead acid batteries with controllers and all that. Uh, Art would say that that's, you know, it was so simple and so easy. Well, Tesla batteries are simple and easy. Running an acid battery pack and taking care of it, and not depleting them and doing the right settings. Well, that got too complicated and that did not work out. So that was a costly error uh, for sure. Um, we mounted the panels on the roof. Uh, I don't think I did quite enough research. In retrospect, I definitely would have put them on the ground. We have four acres of land. We have lots of space. Uh, you get much, I don't know, 10, 20% at least more power on ground mounted uh, if you can change the angle. Uh, you almost want them flat in the summer and at least 45 degrees in the winter. Uh, I have a friend who ha does that. He has a manual setting on his to change the angle. It makes a big difference. So I definitely would have done that differently. Um, now, I, earlier I said that uh, we don't fly. Well, I d hadn't flown for about 20 years. And uh, a couple of years ago, my daughter moved to BC. And uh, well, sad to say, or happy to say, we did fly to BC this summer. I resisted for two years and said, no, I won't fly. No, I won't fly. But uh, the family pressure was such that, and uh, if you do the math, uh, driving out there or taking the, the, the train and such, you know, is, uh, is more carbon dioxide than flying. So we uh, flew and it was a wonderful trip. I was glad we went, but you know, you could call that a success or failure. It was certainly a success in terms of family. Uh, it wasn't a success in terms of flying, but that's the realities of life. We, there are trade-offs and uh, forget being perfect. Uh, perfection, uh, I've come to believe, is, is good for math. Uh, perfect, the per it's very good in engineering. Uh, perfection in human behavior is uh, mostly, I've observed, pathological. So I have no claims to perfection at all. Um, I, uh, in the middle of this, one of the little things we did is we put it in a tin can solar heaters. This is a really nice, simple technology. It's a bunch of tin cans. I'm not sure if they're beer or Coke, but uh, there's no labels on them. Uh, made by some guy in Newfoundland, actually, which is rather funny because, of course, it rains there all the time. Uh, very simple. Uh, sunshine shines on here. The tin cans in here uh, get hot. Uh, there's a fan in the bottom which blows air in a turbulent fashion through the cans and that by the time it reaches the top, the air is extremely warm and it heats your house. Uh, there's a thermostat in here to measure the air temperature so it reaches a certain temperature before the fan kicks in. It's simple, it worked extremely well when I had it on this wall over here, which faced southwest. For better and worse, we put in this sunroom and the rest of the house, I could not attach it on that entire wall. It was all covered with windows or other things. So I had to put it to this wall, uh, which should have been okay. It faces southeast. The problem is what you can't see is where we're standing. There are some very large white pines, which when we moved there were very small white pines, but are now at least 70 feet tall. And most of the time, this wall is now in the shade. So this barely works. Uh, works a little bit in the spring and fall, uh, but not in the winter because the, the shadows from the trees are too high. So that's definitely a failure, uh, which was too bad, but these things happen, unfortunately. Um, the thing that's not happened is their sustainability is a lot about behavior. Uh, we still have food that goes bad in the fridge. Uh, it's been pretty hopeless. We still produce a bunch of garbage and reshingling. Uh, we, I've really tried, but it's been very difficult to change that kind of family behavior. Uh, we've had to reshingle our roof with asphalt because of the solar panels. The, the way the solar panels attach to the roof, uh, that's happening right now, as a matter of fact. The way they attach, they attach to the uh, roof is I'd have to spend, oh, I don't even know if it's possible. I, 
the, the attachments I have only work with asphalt shingles. And so I'm stuck with asphalt, which is definitely last choice. And the other thing, it always seems like we never quite do enough. So there's this sort of underlying sense of, yeah, we're doing stuff, but we're never quite satisfied. And I, you know, we, I think part of being sustainable is to be content. And we're not quite there. We're close, but not, not quite. Um, another failure is, uh, this seems like a funny one, but uh, we used to have chickens in the backyard. So I bought this massive chest freezer so that when we slaughtered our chickens, that we would fill it with chickens. And that, that was a good use for a chest freezer, but we don't do chickens anymore. Um, and we, I've been trying to empty this freezer for over a year of miscellaneous stuff, and I have absolutely failed. You can see that there's ice along the back, which is another indication of failure. And uh, I just can't seem to empty the freezer. And once again, it's, these are behavior changes. And the behavior changes I've found are much more difficult than the technology. Uh, one of the disappointments I have is that when this started off, I mentioned my sister-in-law and said, oh, she spurred me on. I said, look it, will you maybe try to do something or listen to my little sermons if I actually live as close to net zero carbon as possible and do everything? So this summer I was uh, at her cottage and we had a chat and said, look, I, following your your push for which I'm most appreciative, um, I've done blah, 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 blah. Do you, and it's actually worked out. Uh, would you consider trying to do something yourself? And her answer was no. She, it's not part of what she sees as relevant to her life, which I thought she would at least be open to it because, you know, I had basically done what she said. Uh, there, there was no impact. Um, I have lots of good friends. We chat all the time, uh, and they still fly a lot, and they all drive big trucks. So what I'm really saying is that my, my feeling of have I influenced anybody is minimal. Um, so, I mean, there's this idea of, you know, we're all going to be shining lights, and because of what we do, other people will copy us. Uh, I'm sure that's true some of the time. It hasn't been very true for me. Um, also, I mentioned I'd been a Green Party candidate. When I started in 07, uh, people were very polite and receptive, but they said, you know what? You know what you're saying is wishful thinking. You'll never win a seat. The party is, you know, you'll never get anywhere. And, you know, thank you. You know, we appreciate your idealism, but that's not practical. Uh, I've done five elections. Obviously, the Greens have some seats, but certainly around here, Although people are more receptive and more saying that, okay, you're not just idealism, some of this stuff's actually working, they still, by and large, have not translated that, I'd say, acceptance that change has to happen. So that, that has changed. People are verbally saying things, the right stuff, and acknowledging things, but they still don't do anything. They still don't change how they spend their money, which is what it comes down to. It all comes down to hard, cold cash, right? So uh, that brings me to the topic of money. Uh, so here, just to give you a sense of what we're talking about in terms of cash, uh, just so you know, uh, my wife is a nursing prophet Algonquin, uh, and I am on disability. Uh, I've been on disability for many years. So we are extremely middle, middle class. We are, uh, we are certainly not... Uh, doing badly, we're doing just fine, but we are certainly not uh, in the wealthy end of the spectrum. Uh, so just to give you a sense of the cash, the, uh, I had to go into my credit line to do the solar panels. However, the earnings uh, over the lifetime of the solar panels are a three times return on investment. So this definitely paid. Uh, the bees, uh, I had to invest about $1,000 to become a beekeeper, uh, sorry, 2,000 at the beginning, and I've been earning around 1,000 a year. And I've been doing this for 10 years. And it's been lots of fun, but as you can see, the, it, it worked out that way. Uh, the electric car, the bolt after taxes and subsidies was about 36,000. Uh, it's been great, super performance. The cost of electricity compared to gas are about one fifth. Uh, there's been no maintenance, except I had to change the uh, front brake, brake pads. I've had the car 80,000 kilometers now in three years. Um, 
and it's been terrific and obviously massive carbon dioxide savings uh, in, in Ontario, where uh, there is very little, uh, the only, we have some natural gas combustion, but it's mostly uh, nuclear, hydro, and a, a little bit of uh, obviously solar or wind. Uh, the geothermal system, we had, now what made this economic was, we were in the country on oil. And so oil, of course, uh, the insur first of all, the insurance companies hate it. Uh, when we went to geothermal, we saved $500 per year on insurance. Uh, and we were able to time it when there was a subsidy. Uh, so compared to oil, it was terrific. Uh, obviously, when you compare it to natural gas, it's not the same savings. Uh, but even if you're a natural gas, you still cool with AC. The cost of operating ground source geothermal versus AC is one twelfth the cost per BTU. So the British thermal unit, in terms of the energy cost, it's one twelfth. So it's huge savings in terms of money, but also comfort. It's much nicer feeling uh, in terms of AC. Uh, Part of what we're doing, of course, we have uh, the, the mother and mother-in-law here. Uh, there is a cost. You have to be extremely patient and calm, and you have to be uh, sort of talk extremely loudly, which uh, means you have to get away every once in a while. But of course, it saves the, the grannies uh, not only money, but also safety. They now feel safe in the time of COVID. They feel cared for emotionally. So when it's money, it's not just money, there's also quality of life. Uh, I did, as I admit, I admit to flying once in 20 years. Uh, the cost of not flying is obviously not zero, it's actually negative. Uh, so there's the money, but also it's mostly really the CO2. Uh, uh, you know, the flying once a year is usually a approximately you're driving your car for the year if you have a long flight. So that that's that's been as an equivalent, CO2 is an equivalent to money savings. Um, to run all this, we have a total electric house. That means uh, car, heater, stove, the works, hot water. And uh, our cost is about 250 bucks a month. Um, and that's on Hydro One. Uh, Hydro One, for those of you who are city slickers, uh, is about 30% more than uh, Ottawa Hydro. So I have the privilege of being within the city of Ottawa limits, uh, just south of Manitick, but not being part of Ottawa Hydro. I get to pay for country power, which is 30% more than yours in the city. And, and I would say for running the car, and we, we run the car a lot. We charge 98% you know, of the time at the house and everything else. So I would say that that's uh, pretty affordable. Um, Last little bit here uh, is lessons learned. Uh, first thing is get your spouse on board, whoever you're with. It's got to be a team effort. Uh, otherwise, you will undo all your goodness. Uh, research a lot. Uh, talk to people. Uh, prototype if you can. If you can do a small scale thing where you don't have to commit too much cash, uh, that's really good. Uh, sometimes you can't. But if you can, definitely do it. Uh, timing matters. Uh, now would have been a good time to try to go off grid and spend money on the batteries uh, from Tesla. When I did it, it wasn't the right time. It made it more difficult. So timing really matters. Uh, the hardest part, though, is behavior. You know, making choices about behavior, food and flying and what you're going to do for gardening and how you eat, you know, are you, you'll notice I didn't talk about going uh, vegetarian. Uh, for my mother-in-law, if I don't have meat on the table, that means I didn't cook for her. So we have every other meal vegetarian, but we can't do it every day because, well, then we would have a, an insurrection. We would have a revolution on campus if we do that. So these behavior changes are really much harder than just spending money on technology. Uh, so my punchline is that uh, I believe that most middle-class Canadians, uh, if they wanted to, if they really, really wanted to, now there are sacrifices. Uh, we did not go on any big fancy holidays, for example, except to the cottage and to see family and stuff like that. So there are sacrifices.
But if people were highly motivated, and that's why I started with motivation, it's really a question of motivation. If you really want to, uh, you, people can make this happen. Just like I really wanted to get the electric smart car from Toronto, I found a way. And if you really want to, you can actually do it. So I leave you with that. And this is now your time for questions. And remember, this is not saying that this is what you should do. This is not a formula. This is simply an example of one of what one of your K core compatriots did on his journey. And if you were to try to do that, I am sure that all the details would be different. But at least it gives you an example to ponder. Thank you very much. And uh, I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Gordon, for this uh, expose of uh, how you've been living your life for a couple of days, decades, maybe longer than that. Mm -hmm. uh, all the details, wonderful. Um, tell me, uh, you drove from Ottawa to Cape Breton. That's yep. roughly 1,600 kilometers. A yep. thousand miles for the visitors from uh, from United Kingdom um, with a car with a range of what three hundred? Well, four hundred if it's fully charged. And uh, when you drive, you charge to eighty percent. So let's call it realistically three ten, because the last twenty percent takes you know several hours to do the the fit, the charge curve is it charges to eighty percent quickly, and then it's really slow. So yes, that's correct. So our first, you basically drive three hours, and then you find a place to charge, and you have a nap, and that's, which is what we did. And then we drove another three hours and had a nap. We went as far as Fredton the first day, uh, with a hotel which charged us for free, and we arrived there with just about zero, and we could do that. In other words, we got uh, because we knew we were going to charge that night, which cost us nothing. Uh, and then the next day we did the last bit to Cape Breton. So that was a thousand kilometers the first day. Wow. John Meyer, you're up. Okay, you, you have a, uh, a geothermal system, which is your source of heat. And yep. uh, that, that was lacking on the coldest days. Yep. Uh, but you put in new windows uh, yep. in part of it. Uh, I found that windows, if you've got really, really good windows, they might be R5. And in my place, I used, uh, I made my own uh, uh, blinds uh, that uh, uh, are about R8. Yep. And that makes an immense difference uh, on the load of that. I see them in the, is that, is that what I'm seeing on the back here? In the that's picture? Right. That's right. Yeah, that's, that's right. And the, uh, I also, if you see the ladder, that's what I used to put up the film over top of that. So the, the whole thing is just fantastic. Uh, but the question is, you, you've got all of this generation. Yep. And you, what's the size? Do you know what the size of the uh, 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 in BTUs your, uh, your geothermal is? What uh, it's a three ton, which means I think 36,000 BTUs. Not yeah, very much. That, that's not, no, that's not a, a huge It's amount. not enough. The uh, other thing that I found, the other problem is how leaky your house is, right? It's not just about windows. It's, it's all the cracks and stuff. And I found, I did it, they basically, the company who did it lied about the test. And I have a air changes per hour, which should have been around two, and it was closer to five. So I, have, I turns out I have a really leaky house, even though it was built in the year 2000. So they lied on the report, it turned out. Okay, well, I, I was going to say, uh, mm -hmm. you know, putting more money into that into the house uh, and uh, uh, window coverings that go down to the floor and touch the walls on either side. So you cut off the convection and that makes a yep. huge difference. And it would just uh, I mean, I, I'm sure you have to have a telescope <clears throat> there as backup, but reducing your load. Uh, I, I know that's right. Part of it is my wife loves having the windows open all the time. Time. Yeah, well, at, and if it, that's okay. so, I'd have to do it in such a way that it would still look a million bucks. And if it doesn't look a million bucks, it's not going to happen. Okay, well, Taylor, <laughs> this yeah, looks but, great. Take away the ladder. Looks. Yeah, that, that looks actually very good. What have you made yours out of? Uh, cellular uh, material, cellular uh, blind material, uh, and it's uh, it's two layers. So you've got uh, one layer 
uh, three quarter of an inch dead air, uh, another layer, three quarter of an inch dead air, and then in between you've got three quarters of an inch dead air. So that's about R7 or R8 in my Mickey Mouse tests. Right, and where did you get this stuff? I bought it from China. Uh, All because right. No one here uh, will will sell you the, the material that, that I could find, and what certainly isn't. Can you? Unfortunately. Anyway. Can you can you send that link to K Core Climate or something like that, so I can look at like that would uh, the, the link to where you got it. Okay, you that's can, you can uh, send yes. Okay, I'll send it on. Okay. Good. Thank you very much, John. Uh, but John, John is right. John is right in that it's all about the load. Uh, one of the things we did do in the middle is also we uh, tripled our insulation in the attic, uh, which was a really good bang for buck. So I have like a R100 or something up in my attic. And I really noticed that. It was a huge difference. Uh, Arthur. Next question. Okay, okay, I was intrigued by your, your pool. And uh, <laughs> a, a little, little surprised not to see a diving board. But uh, <laughs> uh, uh, because it is a pond uh, and, I, and you use it as a pool, aren't there municipal requirements to have a fence around it? And uh, well, you know, we live in the country, Art, unlike you, City Slicker and Manitic. And the way the country is, is, you know, if you don't tell, I won't tell. So uh, I've, the, the country protocol is quite simple. Get along with your neighbors, you know, give them a beer, whatever it is they want. And, you know, that's, that's my zoning. That's country zoning. Uh, and it's worked extremely well. It's, yeah. So <laughs> as far as I know, it's, it's a pond, but I just did that, you know, it's been good fun. It's been good fun. I've had, I do it more as a sort of cultural kind of test. Anybody who comes by in the summer, I show them the pond and say, you want to go for a swim? And if you're a real country girl or country boy, you do. And everybody from the city goes, yuck. And because, you know, it's a, it, it's a muddy hole in the ground, right? <laughs> but the water is crystal clear. It self cleans. Like it's full of nice, beautiful weeds and it's actually crystal clear. Uh, it, uh, I do have to add recharge it in the middle of a drought, but other than that, it, it never gets slimy, it, and that's just dumb luck. You could dig a hole and it turns into slime. It, uh, that's a very high water table here because we're in the Rideau Valley floodplain, not floodplain, but we're close, and the water comes up to the surface and it replenishes, so there's actually horizontal ground movement that keeps it replenished and clean all the time. Uh, but that's just dumb luck, I must admit. Okay, thank you. Eivor Jean, please. Yeah, hi. Uh, thanks for the talk, Word. It was great. Uh, my question is about whether you think that if all of our households moved to some measure of sustainability, the country could be sustainable, or whether it's actually more important to have our industries become sustainable. Uh, I look at it as not either or in terms of straight production. Um, I don't know the matter. I think it depends upon the province, how industrial the provinces are. Probably in Ontario, the industries would matter more or in Alberta, the industries matter more in terms of emissions. Uh, so the, the problem is that because <coughs> it's a political thing, the way people live and talk influences how they vote, which influences policy, which influences rules. And those rules are the rules within which industry then exists. So the, I would agree in terms of straight production, uh, you'd have to go into after industry. But because we, that will only happen if people do things like recycle. You know, it's sort of, they, they go together because of culture. This is really a cultural thing. And when you see countries which are reducing industrial emissions, part of that cultural package is people live differently. So it's not a technical issue, it's a cultural issue. Um, and so that's where the, the really important bit comes. I find people tend to say, oh, I want some, I, it, this is a good thing, but somebody else should do it. I, I'm not gonna do it 
but industry should do it. So it's sort of a moral pass the buck or almost like a Pontius Pilate kind of behavior. Um, and so this is recognizing that we're, we're social cultural beings and this is part of that. And I don't think the industry thing will happen, which in terms of the numbers would do more, I agree. Uh, I know we have a glut of power in Ontario because they, most of the pulp and paper shut down. Uh, I, I, my first job was as a pulp and paper engineer and pulp and paper is a massive energy hog. And most of the mills shut down in Ontario and suddenly we have too much power. Uh, so that is true, but it's, don't think of them as separate. Gordon, we've just, we're, we're, we've, we've done a pathways project at KCOR. Yeah. Uh, three of us are currently writing um, a draft report for the club. Uh, yep. I've written several pieces on this. If you look at, if you're my sister sitting in England and you look at Canada and you say, there's that guy Gordon living down south of Manitic, between Manitic and Cars, you know, the emissions from Alberta, when they're divided between 37, 38 million Canadians, that's six tons that you're responsible for, Gordon. Uh, How do you true. feel about that? Uh, what do I feel? I feel that to be Canadian is to muddle and we're, we're muddling along and we'll eventually muddle ourselves out of this mess. And we all make mistakes and I, I think it's a giant mistake. When I graduated, uh, I'm a chemical engineer and 80% of my class when we graduated went to Fort Mac. That's where they got a job. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah, that, that's what happened in the 80s, right? Uh, Fort Mac was booming and it, it's mostly chemical engineering. I mean, that's what processing heavy oil is about. Um, I chose not to go there, right? So I, I could have been a happy Fort Mac chemical engineer. But, I, you know, we, we just, I have to find that uh, because of my life's journey, all that I can do at this point in my life is saying, uh, I'll give you, a, basically you do your best. So imagine there's a gravestone somewhere. Uh, there's supposedly a gravestone in Tombstone, Arizona, of some guy. And what it says is, he he done his damnedest. In other words, he did the best he could. And that's the highest compliment. And so I'm doing my damnedest, and that's it. The result is, the result will be what the result be. But all I can do is the best I can do, and I, I'm happy with that at this point juncture in my life, realizing how imperfect it is. And once again, uh, to emphasize, yeah, Canadians are, we're, we're definitely a bit of a muddle. I mean, you know, witness the unfortunate things happening in New Brunswick at the uh, moment. But uh, there was a great quote, I think it was Barry Maritimer said, uh, yeah, we, we make all kinds of mistakes here in Canada. We are highly imperfect, but you know what? It's pretty well worse everywhere else. So, you know, this is as good as it gets, guys, you know? And I thought that was uh, very mature. Ted, please. Okay, can I have my video? Somebody stopped me. Oh, yeah. Right. Okay, right. anyway. Uh, yeah, I, I, that's a marvelous national slogan. Uh, be happy, it's worse everywhere else. But uh, the uh, uh, I am going to actually force you back into politics for a minute, Gordon. <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> because... Uh, there you are. You, you implied that many of the activities or the specific things you did were because money was, subsidies were available or they were gonna bribe you to do it. Yeah, so, yeah. So what should government be trying to bribe us all to do now? Oh, well, I, the bribes, I just, I'm telling a story. I, I'm not, as I said, this is a semi-serious presentation and this just happens to be what happened to me. Well, it's not the answer. This is not a capital T, the answer. This is just an example. Mm -hmm. uh, right, right now, what would we do in terms of Canada? I don't, I think actually it's the, what the Germans do. I, my family's from Germany, okay? And what Germans do is they just make it code. They, they put in a rule for this is the specification and you must meet the specification. So as an engineer, I'm a big fan of just create specifications rather than subsidies that you have to meet and you meet this, the specifications. And then people figure out the technology that works without subsidies because 
it's going to be better, cheaper, etc. So, for example, uh, I would say uh, what's working as an example of what's working in Canada, uh, Quebec has the policy where they uh, the automobile companies have to sell. Uh, I don't know what the percentage is, but a certain percentage of their cars must be zero emissions that are sold from the lots. Uh, the result of that, uh, combined with obviously the cheapest electricity in the country, uh, the result is 60% of all the EVs sold in Canada are sold in Quebec. All right? So that, that kind of tweak, I think, works. Um, I think you, in Canada directly, you'd have to, the most popular thing is you reduce all the subsidies for oil, I'd say, I'd say mostly for Canada, if you reduce all the subsidies for everything, uh, it would more advantage uh, the renewables than disadvantage the renewables because there's so many for the oil and gas industry uh, in particular. If you actually charged the oil and gas industries for their, uh, the, their liabilities now, rather than being able to shove their liable costs down the road, if you say, no, you have to pay the, put the money up front now to clean everything up rather than the taxpayer, which is now happening. The feds and the Alberta government are now have put forth several billion dollars to clean up old oil wells and, you know, put that right up front on the oil companies now, well, it should have been long ago. Suddenly the cost formula changes completely, you know, just make them charge the real cost. And... Things will change overnight in Canada. Thanks, Gordon. That's a great presentation. <laughs> Zach, please. Hi, Gord. Hi, all. Th thanks for the presentation, Gordon. You're welcome. And this isn't going to be so much a question to you as maybe a challenge to the Green Party that you keep on running for. Uh, and because um, I heard you say that uh, part of the reason that you're, you can, you can, uh, uh, charge your electric car and produce no no emissions is because so much of the power in in Ontario is nuclear. And you understand right. that, of course, Elizabeth May would be spinning in her grave if she were dead. Um, <laughs> right, and a few other people in the Green Party. Do you think there's any way uh, that that the Green Party or that I could convince you to try to convince the Green Party to take another look at this nuclear idea because it's the only way anybody's ever going to get enough power to produce enough of the civilization to actually survive what's about to come without eating itself into the ground still again. Uh, um, I've looked, there's a, you're raising the point of calling, it's a term called the EROI, which is the energy return on investment which is how much energy do you have to put in to get out? Uh, that's what you're, you're really raising that ugly question. We heard a presentation about it a few weeks ago. Uh, as an engineer, that concept is uh, near and dear to my heart. In terms of the Green Party, I'm extremely doubtful. Uh, the, the, the new leader would be even more ensconced in the anti-nuclear rhetoric. Um, I, my personal opinion as an engineer is it really depends upon the technology. I think the old nuclear technology has had its day in the sun. And we, uh, the, we've had a lot, several discussions here about fourth generation nuclear, which are small. Uh, part of it is uh, the question that things change. The technology changes, behavior changes, and it really has to do with the idea of microgrids. Um, so I would agree that large, big centralized nuclear power systems are a uh, dodo bird. I will agree with that part of the anti-nuclear. I'm not against nuclear per se. Uh, so it's a matter of will the new fourth generation mini nuclear systems work with a distributed energy grid focused on microgrids? Can that you know needle be threaded? So I think it's possible. I'd have to look at the EROI. There's massive amounts of energy that need to be put into a nuclear station to get the energy out. But I know the same thing can be said for solar. I mean, you're, you're, you're almost net zero with energy for solar for the first 20 years. You barely, you know, with the old stuff, you actually are negative. I know that. The EROI is negative. I know that. So you're, you're right. I don't think the Green Party is going to change. 
uh, am I willing to change? I already have, right? So that's, uh, you've got a yes for me, possibly. I've read a lot on it and it's, it really depends. It, it depends upon the execution. As I've said in the presentation, having a good idea means squat. It's the execution, the details of the good idea, which are everything. So uh, it's really a question of the procedural and how that particular culture changes its technology and behavior to go with it. And if you don't get that straight, the best idea doesn't matter. But I'm not firmly anti-nuke per se, absolutely not. I'm going to come back with you. I won't even accept uh, the, what you said about the dodo birds. I um, take a look at the dodo birds that are that are giving you your 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 um, your electricity in in Ontario. The can do reactor, sort of. The, I keep on calling it the uh, Avro Arrow of of the nuclear industry. Uh, yeah. So there were some big ones that actually did work. And they produce, I think, something like 80% of the dispatchable power in Ontario. Um, yeah, uh, I don't want to buy that much. However, thank you. Thank you for at least coming this far. And, uh, I, uh, and, and now I understand that the greens are still, the greens are still, the greens are yeah, still. Yeah, the greens. yeah, they're still like that, unfortunately. They, they, unfortunately, they have succumbed to, like all political parties, ideology, rather than just looking at, you know, this is what's actually going on. And that, that's, that's a risk in politics. You know, ideology can be a horrible, blinding thing. In terms of the can-do system, the sad part, of course, the rest of the world doesn't use it, right? Mm -hmm. So it's all very well and nice to say can-do, but nobody else has ever picked up on the can-do. Like, it just hasn't happened. So Except, except for India. Yeah, well, um, that's, for, that's, that's because they... Stop, send it to... Them. Jan Pugsley, please, you must be the better half of someone we know. <laughs> uh, we have no sound, Jan. Oh, can you, un uh, can you find the button to unmute your... Oh, How's that's, that? uh, that's better, Jan. Perfect. Now we can hear no. you. I'm the kid's sister. Oh, oh okay, oh. great. Hello, kid sister. Hiya. <laughs> um... It looks like I have two things because my older brother suggested I mention something. But before that, yeah. I am most intrigued that you have a pond. We have a pond. It's on top of an Alvar. What's an Alvar? Um, it's a limestone pavement generally found only around the Great Lakes. Okay. Um, but let's let's concentrate. Okay, so we got this pond. Yeah. And we're on bedrock. Yeah. And there were a lot of amphibians around this year. So I recognize, you know, you're walking along the driveway and like 16 frogs jump up. Yeah. And it's quite amusing. Did you know that amphibians and reptiles are species at risk? Yeah, of course. Of course. Oh, you knew? Yeah, of course. Oh. But there was no pond there. I dug the pond and now they have a better home than they had before, which was they had no home there. So I created that home for them. And have you ever heard of something called iNaturalist? No. Well, because we had so many amphibians, right? Um, it's an upload, so it required. I was involved. I took a picture, and then I uploaded it, and yep. then the, the folks in the government of Canada and Ontario would use that to determine the trends and where the critters are and where they're not. Right. Oh, very interesting. So you can do that too. Come next spring. Oh, good. That would be lovely. I just you don't like have to feeling. touch them or anything. Oh, I don't. I don't touch them because I know it's it, it's not good for their skin to be touched. I know exactly, that. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, I know that. And they always jump out of the way. I do and live I'm happy with that. very close to the Bruce Peninsula National Park, and oh, they tell me that the Eastern Massasauga is still still knows how to bite. 
So <laughs> I keep my distance yeah. with the critters, but I know they're at risk. The second mm -hmm. thing is, re let's get back to the bedrock. We've had geothermal for about 10 years, and yeah. but I'm not the house expert. Right. Um, one caution is that, okay, you get the geothermal, but it requires electricity. So if you have a hydro outage, and I'm sure you in the country know about hydro yeah. outages. Uh, you all, we had three, we had three last week. <laughs> exactly. Only three. Well, um, we uh, also have, well, we have a diesel, good, eh? gen, we have a generator which produces electricity because the geothermal needs electricity. Yeah. It does. Keeping yeah. in mind the, the, the technical expert is not here. I just, right, right. it's just something that's pretty important. Come the winter and the oh, hydro yeah. goes out for three hours, three days. Well, it happens and, all the time. We actually have a wood stove in the living room, right. a very big wood stove, which can heat our entire house. And then the pellet stove for the basement, which could heat our entire house. Uh, now, the G pellet stoves don't work when there's a power outage unless it's a DC motor. So I right. bought a pellet stove with a DC motor, which would run off a deep cell battery. So, and yes, do you have any propane at all? Uh, we, we do, but we're not using it at the moment. We used it for cooking. Uh, I do not have a generator, but uh, I have enough. I got a, managed to, because the water comes in about 10 feet of the surface, I was able to install, once again, for you city people, this doesn't matter, but if you're a country person, you'll understand. It's country key. We talk, is, uh, I have water. Of course, you get water from the well, and you need power for your right, well water. Got a well. So what oh, I did yeah, is I installed right. yep. a, I, yeah, the big deal. Oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> and uh, so what I did is I, I installed a hand system in my basement, which is creates enough suction to bring water up the 10 feet of head, into my into my house to a bucket. So if I'm desperate for water, not enough to run the house, but it will mean I have water to drink and cook. So I installed that system as well for that same reason. But all without a generator. I don't have a generator. But I have heat, I got I got light. So I'm I've got the basics covered and I've got propane a propane range to cook. So I'm good. Okay. Thank you, Gordon and uh, Jan. Okay. Cameron thank you. Cameron, you're on deck. Thank you. Uh, Gordon, I'd like to say a wonderful presentation. I enjoyed it. Thank you so much. I, ho I hope um, you enjoyed my outhouse at the end. Did you notice the outhouse right at the end? I did. I did. <laughs> Wonder wonderful addition. <laughs> um, my question may in part have been answered by uh, Mr. Manning's question, uh, but you had stated that motivation plays a big factor in people altering their decision making. Yeah. So yeah. ultimately, my question is, what incentives do you think can be implemented to create this change? Um, I'm a little older than you. And so um, my experience, unfortunately, is that a negative incentive is more powerful than a positive incentive, unfortunately. So you have to do all the positive stuff. However, you know, the, there is a research that the psychological impact of positive versus negative is about 10 to 1. So for one bit of negative, you need 10 bits of joy, which are equivalent. So um, my experience is that most of us need a, a harsh kick in the pants and that if we would stop pretending and stop being nicey-nicey and actually just see things the way they actually are, in other words, the the, the nasty part of stuff, that would be an incentive. So the example is California. Uh, California is having horrible things happen there, right? The fires and the floods and the this and the that. And uh, I am sure that's part of why California is trying the most to achieve net zero carbon of any state and doing everything they do. It's uh, the, human nature seems to need, uh, you know, when things are nice and going <laughs> well and we're happy, why would we change? My, my quote on my email is from my opening page, uh, which is to the effect that, uh, uh, what's it say exactly? Change happens when the pain of staying the same 
is greater than the pain of change. Because quite frankly, change is hard. Change is difficult. Uh, change has risk. And it's all true. It's all true. But when you realize, oops, where the space I'm in is not working. So uh, I would reveal the, the, the pain that is out there, uh, which includes, uh, there's actually lots of psychological pain going on. Uh, loneliness, for example, is, is a big one. Uh, and that's really actually part of the sustainability thing. That's why I emphasize that we live together, that we share the garden, because there's the pain of being alone. And I think that is huge. When people are in a negative funk and feel stressed, they can't change. So most of the people I know who can't change can't because their life is, they're right that they're, they're just barely getting through the day. They, you know, they had an argument with their 16 year old daughter or their, their boss hates them or whatever. And they, they, they're just overwhelmed. Um, so yes, you open up the door by showing things, uh, but it's also revealed the real price. I, you know, I'm a big fan of if you included the real price of the damage from natural gas, for example, and all the methane leakages, and just include that in the price, suddenly the, the happy news uh, of an electric car would exist. Or uh, like a little example, uh, people are, whatever, if you advertise enough, they'll buy anything, right? Do you agree with that, Cameron? I would. Do you advertise some? Yeah. So they ad, notice they advertise trucks like crazy. And how many ads have you seen for a Chevy Bolt? Zero. Yeah. Any, have you seen any ads at all for Chevy Bolt? No. No. But they advertise trucks like crazy. So it's very simple. All you have to, you'd have to do to change the playing field is stop the truck ads and advertise it. You know, so it's those kinds of things. I, I'm not sure that uh, just being happy, happy makes sense. I think part of it is there, there is some necessary uh, helpful pain. I mean, there's good pain and bad pain. For me, if pain helps you move and change, that's good pain. I don't have a problem with that kind of pain. Uh, chronic pain where you don't move and you stay stuck and traumatized, obviously that's not helpful. But a little bit of pain, a little bit of a wake me up, which has happened to me, uh, wasn't a bad thing. All right. Um, so I guess I'm sort of coming from that perspective. I don't know if that helps at all. Um, hey, thank you so much. I think, I think in Canada, we try to be too nice, basically. Canadians are too damn nice. Thank yeah. you, Gordon. You may have studied Gordon, engineering. Gordon, I, I'd just like to make a comment. I desperately take uh, that truck can because we take I have all this manure to shift every time that I turn on TV. So, <laughs> <laughs> the thing is that I don't they, watch TV. They, they are playing with your mind, making you want things. Uh, there's a, a marvelous uh, book uh, out called The Hidden Persuaders, done years ago, that essentially talk about creating demand. And yep. we're unfortunately 100% suckered by it. Uh, we all work. It all works. There's a great show on Netflix called The Social Dilemma, which is about that and how the internet makes it even worse. Uh, so my solution is I don't, my kids never had TV. That's part of the thing growing up. They never had computer games growing up. We've never, we don't watch, we don't watch TV ever. Um, yeah, I, if I read the news, I definitely don't watch American news. It's absolutely hysterical, emotional trash. Uh, so I'll read the BBC, something objective, or the, 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 the German newspapers translated, you know, that kind of a thing. Uh, but, uh, or something from Singapore. So, so I'm not like I'm uninformed, but, uh, so what you have to do in terms of responding maybe more positively to Cameron's question, you, you actually have to change the propaganda and you have to put in some big rules. Sorry, you're no longer allowed to advertise trucks, gentlemen. You just sit around, on the table like it's war and you've heard that metaphor Cameron you know it's war we're now gonna instead of making it's 1939 instead of making cars you're now making tanks there you go you'll still make money we guarantee you'll still make money but you're now making electric cars too bad and you're gonna advertise them and you know we and there you go you forget this choice crap you know we don't really have a choice if you study what's going on it's there isn't an option actually it's just a matter of in terms of avoiding pain I mean there's going to be pain and it's just how much pain and when you want to have it. 
And will it be helpful constructive pain or destructive spiraling out of control pain? And uh, the way pain works is the earlier you do stuff, the more it's constructive, helpful pain as opposed to the nasty kind. So I'm trying to avoid the nasty kind of pain. But there is pain. There, there was sacrifice. Absolutely. I, I'm not going to sugarcoat that. But it was positive. You feel afterwards, it's like a good dinner. You feel good afterwards. You feel like, yeah, that was, I, I'm okay with that, right? Emotionally. It has to be you feel positive emotionally. Otherwise, forget it. This sort of self-sacrificing idealist who does going to save mankind, I'm not a big fan of that. Uh, I haven't seen that work out well in the real world for real people. You know, maybe saints, not me. <laughs> Thank you, Gordon. Jeff Passmore, you're on deck, please. If I'm on deck, John, it means I'm next. So I'm actually batter up. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, where's, where's your baseball bat, Jeff? Get that baseball bat. John, uh, I, John, I'm an, John, yes, I'm I know. Jeff. Sorry? I, I was before Jeff. I said, I have a question about ground source heat, heat pumps. Okay, okay. Can, Gene, can sorry. I just say that uh, I have to leave? I've got another oh, okay, webinar. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead, Jeff. Well, no, I, it's okay, Gene. I, I, you can go. I just have to leave. I've got another webinar starting in five minutes, and I need to get prepared for it. Uh, I wrote my story there. Great presentation, actually, uh, Gord. I told you a little bit of my story. Uh, my only comment yeah. would be that rather uh, than sitting around here, um, you know, commenting on how things are and should be, uh, KCOR should be writing a letter to the Prime Minister demanding an end to oil subsidies. Yeah, well, it's been tried and tried and tried. It's, it's one of the good Green Party policies. Well, they I'm keep promising they're the going Green to do Party it. They promised, it, they, they promised they it in their first they, mandate. You know, when McKenna was the Environment Minister, they yeah, promised it in their first they did, mandate. They did. And, uh, they, and but there's no pressure yeah, now to yeah, do that. Everybody's absolutely. forgotten about this. I think COVID. Uh, sorry, no. I think uh, KCOR. Absolutely. Should, uh, uh, you know, together with other groups, whether it's uh, you know Group of 78 or whatever, but uh, put together a letter and send it to the Prime Minister. Anyway, I'm sorry, people. I I need to leave. Sorry, Gene. No. That's okay. Thank you, Jeff. Gene. Thank you, Jeff. Thanks. Okay, Gene, your question about geothermal, Gene. Yes, I do. Um, I was fascinated by um, your comment about uh, how good the air quality was and so on. Year, a few years ago, Dave and I, we have a house that is in urban suburban Ottawa. Yeah, and yeah. we had a, a person come out to tell us um, about the possibility of putting in a ground source heat pump. And the problems of a suburban house and an area where you don't have a great deal of land constrains how big a system you can put in and the effectiveness of putting it in. In addition, especially in Ottawa, the, um, our house is very, very near bedrock. So uh, instead of putting the heat source down, it would have to go horizontal to get enough, uh, enough um, stuff coming through. So it would have taken up our whole backyard and we would have had to have had, a, a, it just was impractical. So I, I, yep. I'd love to have done it, but just the practicality. And so my question to you is how much of what you've been able to do was the fact that you are living in a, a rural setting with a big property that allows you to do this stuff with right. a relative ease. Okay. So good point. There, there are the devils in the details and that's why the research bit and getting the execution really matters, right? Because mm -hmm. good ideas, who cares? Uh, and there are no generalizations. First of all, I'll go back one step. Since I put in the geo ground source, air source heat pumps, which cost a tiny fraction, the, the, the technology has been revolutionized. Uh, they w work well now down to minus 20, and they're a tiny fraction of the cost. If you have a smaller uh, energy efficient house, which doesn't need you know 40,000 BTUs, Definitely don't even go ground source, go air source. That's the first comment. Okay. Um, secondly, I have a vertical well, which doesn't need a lot of space, but so it's not a space issue. It is a geology issue. Okay, I'm in an area where it's easy to drill through and it's wet. The wetness really matters because your heat and cooling actually comes from the water. And the water is always moving where I live. So when I extract the heat energy from the water, um, I, the water, new water moves in and it comes out. However, 
once again, the technology has improved a lot. What Art is doing shows you, and he doesn't have a huge yard. He has a normal suburban yard. So his technology, which is much more advanced than mine and far superior, is able to do that on a regular suburban lawn. Okay, so you can do it. It's a matter of the technology and the time. It's different now than 10, 15 years ago. There's a, a new building in Ottawa, which um, is using a ground source vertical well to heat and cool the entire building. You know, so the techno it's a matter of the technology has arrived. It does work in bedrock. It just means you need more feet. Okay, so if you have wet or whatever, you, you can do it. It just means you need, depending upon the math, you know, maybe double the number of foot. So, you know, it costs a lot more, true. So you're right there. So there are, but you tried to do this how many years ago, Jean? Uh, four, five. Okay, well, it, that, that was pretty modern. That's pretty good, pretty good stuff, but you are right. You are right. There are limitations which basically increase cost, absolutely. But you, you once again, it's a matter of how bullheaded and, you know, the other costs. I was comparing, remember, it's unique to my situation. I was comparing it to oil. You know, you can't compare oil costs to what you've got. And my house is a leaky house and your house. So, you know, once again, I just told you a story as an example of food for thought. I'm not meaning this as a recipe in any way. And whatever I did 10 or 15 years ago, the world is a different place now. Technology is literally changing radically every year for the good, for the positive, if I to make this stuff even easier to do, actually. It's much easier now than it's ever been. Could I just jump in here for a sec and say, uh, I, I support your comments about going air-to-air -air heat pumps. I mean, if you're just looking at, at uh, uh, heating and cooling, what I like about a ground source heat pump is that I use it for energy storage. Yeah. And that's a big step forward. Um, and and of course you have to have the uh, the right soil conditions and this later clay is, is lovely stuff for yeah. doing what i'm doing anyway yeah, but yeah, is, yeah. at below minus 20 which we do get once in a while here what's your solution i mean it's the air source is going to work to minus 20 but if we have a minus 25 or minus 30 day uh, what what is the fix you, you well, need you... just let me comment on that that uh with with of course global warming you, you start to talk about the number of hours in the year where it's actually below minus 25 or whatever it is and and those minus 30 days where there's a couple hours in the day where it's that low um are are, are reducing now if it means that you have to go to uh electrical resistance heating that's what it means you know, yeah. and you, you swallow the cost. You just yeah. sort of my heater. Yeah. yeah. My, my geothermal system by code has to have an electrical heater built into it because of insurance companies. So I do have giant electrical heaters in my geothermal. I've never used them, but by code, they have to be there, right? So they're, they're there. And that, that's basically what you do. I've never used it, right? But that's the, that's the only option. And once again, if you look at our well, I think we got uh, uh, an audio problem here, Gordon. We seem to have lost you. But... Gordon's voice is lost, I think, Art. Um, okay, so okay. you're still there, Gordon? I will. We've, we've only got Mary left any, in any event. We're coming up to 90 minutes. It's one of the pr privileges of living out in the country, a, a weak internet connection, because uh, his voice disappeared. A yeah, little. I, I disappeared completely as well. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yes, go ahead. Yeah, I lost contact completely. Uh, for... Uh, Quite frankly, for a person, once again, depends upon the person. My issue is more heat than cooling. Um, I have a heart condition, and if it's too hot, people with heart conditions die, and I would be one of those people. So I'm very, very grateful for the cheap and nice cooling. That's been the surprise for the ground source. The cooling is so terrific. Uh, and so 
in the U.S., they mostly use, the big plus in the U.S. is because of cooling, and the cost of operation are minimal, uh, approaching zero. Because I just have to pump a fluid around. Because I have a closed loop system, it's a so the the pumping costs are very low. Okay, can we get to Mary before I I close the recording off? Uh, Mary Hegan, would you like to unmute yourself, please, and then we and turn your video on. Okay, whoops. Oh, there I see Mary. I see, well, I see her name. Anyway, hi there, Mary. Hi. Um, yes, um, the host has turned my video off, it tells me, not me. Okay. <laughs> well, we know who you so, are, Mary. <laughs> they want me to disappear. That's fine. Um, yeah, I've been finding this fascinating and... Um, I guess my question to you, uh, Gord, is you talked about being in tune with nature, making a difference in how our future behavior might be. And I wondered, because you do live in the country and you have shown us your lovely gardens and acreage and ponds and whatnot, what has been most important to you from a nature, learning from nature perspective for being for living living more sustainable uh for me it's been my kids uh the fact that they <laughs> look at the world and themselves they don't just think about the human world they see the human world embedded in, in the bigger world uh, my one of my daughters had anorexia which was very difficult uh, she has just finished a master's thesis looking at nature therapy uh, and in terms of how that, that sense of the human experience is embedded in the natural world as her thesis for her master's degree. Uh, wow. another, another daughter is doing a master's in sustainable energy policy with the engineering school at Carleton. You know, the fact that my kids are doing that, that, that for me is success. You know, it's not, I mean, you know, it's not just that you have to live in the country. I mean, it's, it's actually in many ways easier if you're in the city, you know, this is only one story and I'm not recommending. I mean, the fact is you can't have millions of people living like I live. It's just not physically possible, right? This is only one story. And if somebody else, lived in an apartment somewhere, they could reduce their footprint even easier, right? It's a different story. Uh, but for me, it's been the kids. It's been my children. Um, and it's, it's, it's worked. And because I found that I'm a teacher and talking uh, pretty much has no impact uh, on anybody. So I, I just did this without talking about it. We just did it. And they then, you know, monkey see, monkey do with the kids. So it has worked with the kids. Uh, and it's been great. And no sermons, no lectures, no nothing. They just, this is just normal. This is what they consider normal. This is just what you do, right? Of course, right? It's like you grew up in a musical family. Well, of course you sing. You don't talk about singing. You just, you sing, right? So that, it's been, it's been that kind of a thing. And so that's been very satisfying. Really it comes down which is interesting which is interesting when KCOR starts to think about things like trying to make all their interesting research and reports on the pathway really usable by lots of people whether you're a politician or an, an individual running your household so yeah okay thank uh, you yeah eventually that turns into policy which then changes how industry does stuff you know so if you i was talking with a friend who uh, i did have one small success yesterday i was at one of those uh drive-by covid parties where somebody's moving and you drive by and honk and everything i don't know if you've been part of those but i've done several and uh so because you can't go up to the right so you drive by and honk and one of them i tutored her daughter in math and they just bought a used BMW electric car, which is all carbon fiber. The whole body is carbon fiber and aluminum and the whole car, everything is completely recyclable. And that's because by law in Germany, they made a simple rule. Whoever makes the product is responsible for the cost of the disposal. 
And so suddenly industry does something different, right? Uh, but that pressure came from the population because the value of the population said, no, this is what we want because of how we live and what we value. Then you have an industrial result, which is where the results actually matter. Okay, I would agree with the question earlier. In terms of reality, it, you know, what do industries do? But that doesn't, that comes from somewhere. They're not going to do it without pressure that comes from us, which comes how we live and how we treat each other. And so the industrial stuff is the result of how we are. Okay, and I think we're now at uh, uh, our, uh, our time limit. I'm going to now uh, terminate the recording. I thank you very much, George, and we'll...